Hello, um, Melissa. Hello, Doc. Good I want morning. to welcome you to our first Artist Talk of 2022. I'm the new director of the Photo Center, Melissa Kieser. Um, and I'm happy to have the Photo Center open and operating now um, since September. And if you haven't been here since we closed, we um, have a new reference library dedicated to David Johnson. Um, we have our enlarger, our 40 and larger dark room, and then our beautiful exhibit space has new lighting. And our digital lab will be reopening hopefully um, by this summer with uh, new computers. Mm -hmm. So um, the exhibit, Jock McDonald's The World's Exhibit, is open until March 3rd. So come by if you haven't seen it yet. The prints are gorgeous, gorgeous large prints, and um, it's just beautiful just to see the really gorgeous black and white prints. Thank you, um, Melissa. <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce Jock McDonald, and I'm going to read a little bit from his bio. Um, Jock McDonald has photographed the famous and the infamous, the beautiful and the triumphant, the ridiculous and the sublime, living and working in Napa. Um, McDonald's work is an exploration of portraiture and landscape photography, which aims to capture the essence of humanity by focusing on the bonds that unite rather than the walls that divide. As McDonald says, if art represents the highest form of hope, it is my desire to throw visual emotional weight on our shared humanity. So with that, I would like to introduce Jock. Good morning, people. Dobre den, as they say in the Ukraine. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for that, uh, Melissa. Um, it's uh, good to be here uh, with the Harvey Milk Center. And I would like to start out by reading the introduction uh, from the show, The Rurals, um, which goes like this. I don't have it committed to memory. Um, the Rurals project became and continues to be a project of discovery. It has revealed to me qualities of rural community life that are threatened by technology, not only in Russia and the Ukraine, but the United States as well. The villages I vis visited in Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Mexico, and Cuba were largely agricultural. The farming in these rural areas is relatively primitive. The technological backwaterness seems to me to have some positive as well as negative results. I feel that the people I meet in these villages despite their tremendous hardships, lead richer lives than many of the highly civilized peoples I meet in large cities of these countries, due to the depth of their sense of connection to others. The project is a modern journey back in time to a connectedness of soul to soil, of the individual to family. Maybe I'm only lamenting the loss of the good old days and the human values of those times, I recognize the vast distance we have covered in such a short time and the ironic creation of the global village and the de dehumanization that comes with the technological advances. This is the price tag for the velocity at which we are choosing to travel. To sit at a table with three generations of people after farming all day long with them, singing ancient songs that are handed down through the generations was a profoundly moving experience for me. It is with reverence and awe that I've been drawn to these villages of these rural peoples. I recognize a connection between them and all of our own rural ancestors. I believe that the photographs I took captures dimensions of community life that is disappearing and not, on, not entirely for healthy human reasons. I'm not a historian or a sociologist, but I believe that when people lose agriculture as their dominant way of living, their societies decay. It is not the loss of farming itself that is responsible for the decay. It is rather the loss of those qualities of life that require a community's acknowledged interdependence and communal awareness. And the substitution of either too much individual self-seeking or the sub subordination of the human community to abstract corporate enterprise. Welcome all. Um, this is a, uh, a, a video stills I put together laid out by country. I started in the Soviet Union uh, with an exhibition called Positive Negatives, which was an entirely different body of work of portraits of people that had, um, had done uh, things in the interest of 
the betterment of society by saying no, like Rosa Parks or other folks. Um, and I ended up in the Soviet Union <clears throat> and my fiance ran off and married my best friend. And I was in a bit of a kerfuffle, as they say, uh, because of that. And I asked my friend, uh, uh, Gianna and uh, Leonid to take me out to the country to clear my head. And they did, and they, they took me out to this collective farm. And it was here that I had my first encounter with uh, rural peoples um, in, a, in a foreign country. My, my background is my, my uh, grandfather was a farmer in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia, Canada, and he raised fruit and hogs. Because if your fruit's bad, you feed them to the hogs and you get great, you get great hog. And so it, it runs in my blood, um, uh, that uh, aspect of uh, my family history. And uh, on this one, I was out there for a, about a week, but on this one day, I did about 26 portraits of people. And out of the 26, I think I got 25 images that I really liked. And I don't speak much Russian or Ukrainian now. And I spoke absolutely none whatsoever i mean i could say spasiba or pajolsta you know and and that was pretty much it i think i could also say vada for water and vodka for vodka i think that was sort of the extent of <laughs> the extent of my my knowledge but um i became so intrigued by this communal living um <clears throat> my friend who's a curator in cuba uh, Nelson Ramirez says two things about my work. Um, one, he says that Jock is someone who travels the entire world looking to take the same portrait over and over again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the other was about this connectedness um, that I have with communist countries. And I've been to all the communist countries. I've been to the Soviet Union. I've been to Cuba. I've been to China. Um, uh, I've been to uh, Berkeley, and uh, I have one left to go, which is North Korea, but I'm sort of saving that for later. But as I was moving through uh, these communities, uh, another thing struck me about these, this country, particularly the Soviet Union, was that when I pointed the camera at my subjects, they didn't change. They didn't start smiling for the camera. I want to pause here for a sec. Um, can you go back to this image, Melissa? Yes. This one? This, I, I'm, I, I'm going to jump around a little bit because it's not interactive Zoom in the way I'm used to talking in terms of a lecture. But mm -hmm. I started going back. Um, I met a man named Archie Lieberman, who was a um, Life magazine photographer. And he did a project called uh, Farm Boy where he was sent to an assignment, an assignment in the United States to photograph a, uh, a family that farmed still. And he continued with that project till the farm boy that he photographed had children and then his children, children were still farming. And so he had this three or four generations of, of these family farming. And his work is extraordinary because you see the father holding the baby and then you see that baby holding a baby and and you see the renovation of the farm and and the hard work and and it's the multitude of portraits become the one portrait and he gave me this advice he said well your work is great but what you need to do is sit on your heels a piece you need to hang out with these people and not rush them with a camera um, because they don't know you and great photography is actually built on trust. And I think that that's such a powerful um, idea. So I ended up in the Ukraine. I started out in the Soviet Union, but that was mostly in, in Russia and, and in about 1990, 1991. And I met a, a gentleman, uh, Sergei Samborsky, who became a very good friend of mine. And what ended up happening in, in the rurals is people became very proud of their country. And he said, let me take you to the Ukraine. Nice. And I said, great, let's go. He goes, my aunt's there, Valentina. I have a lot of relatives there and, and, and they'll love you. And, and uh, 
you know, so I went and the Ukrainians immediately gave me a nickname, which is Jaka. And so we stayed with Valentina. This is Sergei Samborsky's aunt, Valentina. And she, that's her potato garden. And I love how her dress is, you know, flowering with her garden and the potatoes, you know, we ate those potatoes. She baked her own bread. She had a fruit garden behind her and had, has chicken and hogs and is largely completely independent of the grocery store and inside her wood-fired oven where she would bake these marvelous large loaves of bread she also had a small still of coming out of it where she was condensing potato vodka and and I didn't realize that that's what that was at first until she invited Sergey and I to come out to the garden and have a some chuska chai, as she would call it, which means a cup of tea. Well, as she poured the teapot into these dainty little cups, that wasn't tea. That was that potato vodka <laughs> coming out of that, that oven. And wow. following in this idea of uh, Archie Lieberman's idea is I would then go back in, the, in winter to give the photographs to the people I'd photograph. So let's go to the next image. And this is Valentina on the same spot of land in the middle of winter. And I just love the transformation. Uh, my high school photographer said, if you can show the passage of time in your photographs, you will amplify your photographs. But I think this does that fairly well. Um, you know, she's got the, the, the pail cause she was slopping the pigs. And, and uh, I became quite ill when I was there <clears throat> in, in Russia with the flu. And they have this marvelous design in their house where the, the fireplace is in the center of the house, but the chimney runs along uh, near the ceiling. There's probably a four foot gap between the ceiling and then it goes out the back of the house. And that's where you have your bed up on the top of that chimney because nice. it's, it's so warm. And uh, so she tucked me in there when I was ill and felt my forehead and, and was nursing me back with homemade raspberry tea, not the vodka this time, but... Um, I became very connected uh, to her um, in sort of a Ukrainian grandmother way. And so, um, you know, I went back several times to, to see her. And, and um, there's some other stories where like this hat I'm wearing. Um, can I share screen? Yeah, go ahead. Hopefully it'll go. You were starting screens or what other participants yeah. are sharing. Okay. You can go ahead now. Yeah, here we go. Here it is. So if you can see the hat I'm wearing, this is the hat was given to me by this gentleman. And uh, he made this hat out of straw. You can't believe it. It's hand stitched. It's an extraordinary hat. I've, it hasn't aged a day since he gave it to me. I wear it fairly often. If you look at his face, you wouldn't know it, but he had had a stroke about a month earlier, two months earlier. And his wife, who was the village healer, said, if you give Jaka the hat, you will get better. And I was like, I can't take this guy's hat. I'm like, anyway, he insisted on giving me his hat and he did get better. And I've thought about that over the years. I think that what's really going on in the magic of the healing or that is that he probably was afraid he was going to die. And the generosity is an act that you're, I mean, if you're giving your stuff away when you're dying, that's one thing, but I saw him over the years and I'd wear the hat and it gave him such joy for me to wear it. It was just crazy. Aww. So, and the shirt I'm wearing, um, a guy named Les, Sergey left me <laughs> with his friend up in the mountains with Les and his family and Les, I don't have a picture of Les. I, I don't know why I couldn't find it, but he took me by the hand. He, he was incredibly strong. He was a little guy. He's about five foot two. I'm not exactly tall. I'm five foot eight. But next to a five foot two man, you feel big. But he dragged me into his bedroom and was motioning for me to take my shirt off. And I'm like, whoa, 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 Les. <laughs> Now's not the time to be woke. <laughs> I just, I, and I don't speak Ukrainian. And anyway, long story short, he took his shirt off. Um, and, and I took mine off and he gave me the shirt I'm wearing. He literally gave me the shirt off his back. And uh, 
Wow. Um, because love is an action in a sense, you know, and that's how they express um, their love and their their uh, get in here ness. So, um, I just I actually get a little choked up when when I think of these stories because I haven't been back to those countries in a few like years now, and Valentine is dead and. And less is as well. And, you know, the wheel of time has turned. Um, and so, you know, photographs are markers, you know, they're, they're, they're memories. And um, there's a, a thing that can happen, I think, with photographers, maybe painters too, or, or that is that we get attached to the story of the photograph. And it can really mess up our ability to judge whether or not it is actually a good or great photograph you know if the story is fantastic it's like oh my god we took a sidecar motorcycle up a dry river creek to get to this house and we were met by then and then we took this picture no one knows that part of the story and even if you wrote it down it has no correlation to if the photograph is good or not and so i think it's important to learn to distance oneself from the journey of the photograph Yes. to the actual photograph. Um, I kind of want to stop it here and, and um, see if anybody has any questions or they want to steer this in a certain way or, or um, I just feel like I'm, um, it's just me and Melissa talking, but I gather there's a, a, a gathering behind this screen. Let me, I'm just going to look. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If we have any questions, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Or we don't have to wait till the end uh, to do yeah. questions. Yeah. So, um, if you could continue with the images, Melissa. Okay. Spasiba Bolshoya. Yeah, so Valentina. She's beautiful. Here, let's go back. I want to go back to the, because this is, this is a, just a site sort of photographer geek out thing. Go back one more image. Okay. So if you see in the, in the back, not that one, that guy walked three miles out of the mountains to play at my birthday party. See the tree in the back with the white on it? Yes. In, the, in the left side. So I shot this portrait with 120 millimeter lens and then um, and then go to the next one image. No, I'm sorry. This is shot with 120 millimeter and the other one was shot with an 80, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> see how the tree is bigger? Yeah. But it's still in the shot and you can see that it's sort of a, a marker of her being on a pretty much the same spot of land. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let it run. Okay. We do have a question from Edward Collins. Yep. Um, did you take your development and darkroom gear to Ukraine? If so, how did you manage it all? Yep, I did not take any developing uh, materials with me or that. I, I brought it all back with me. Um, it's all shot on Hasselblad on 120 millimeter film and uh, just Back in the day, you could either get a 12 exposure roll or a 24 exposure roll. The 24 rolls often would break <laughs> in the middle when you would be cranking on it because the film base was thinner. So, you know, not that it's relevant anymore, but shoot on the 12. Um, I would develop when I'd get back home. Um, it's just too difficult to get a dark room with traveling. I mean, you can lock yourself in a bathroom, but I wasn't in hotel rooms. I'm sleeping in barns traveling you know and so that just wouldn't be possible okay. does that answer the question no i didn't <laughs> i believe so we have a question from audrey daniel how do you feel about the sociological element of the history you have documented wow that's a hell of a question um i what was powerful way to put the work up at the harvey milk center was i haven't seen it as a body of work in a long time I think what's critical about it is the intro that I read, which is even when I took these photographs back in 1990s, back 90s and early 2000s, when people would look at the work, it already looked old. It already had a vintage feel because of their clothing and you know the, the environments that they're living in. Can we pause it here, yeah. Melissa? Um, I think that's for those coming after me once I'm in the dirt to figure out whether it has any value. Um, uh, a lot of the work has been published. 
when I think back over doing the work, I think what I, I think that it was all about my own internal journey, actually, of, I never knew my grandfather. He died of um, uh, what they called consumption then, which was tuberculosis. And I think in some ways it was a search for roots. I mean, I'm not Ukrainian or Russian or Chinese or, or that. I'm, I'm just a good solid mutt that came out of Ireland and England and you know Sweden. But also this idea of what is the meaning of life? You know, what actually gives life meaning? And I think that it comes down to one very basic thing, which is our relationships is what gives it meaning. And the, I don't remember who wrote this very short, short poem, but it says, they don't build one seater sports cars. Someone needs to be in the passenger seat with a martini in one hand and a chocolate bar in the other shouting, woohoo, as you go into the corners of life. And so I think it was a search for relevance. Um, and, um, you know, there's that famous photograph, the National Geographic photograph, which is sort of the, the Mona Lisa, you know, the gal with the green eyes and, and that was the cover. And I think there are certain faces that speak to us in a universal language. And I may have a couple of those, but it's such a big question you're asking and you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm inside of it. And so I would put it back on you. Do you think it has any relevance? Long pregnant pause. I have another question from Catherine McDonald. How open were all your subjects to being photographed? Were these all on the spot or did you spend time be, time before the, with them you shot? That's a great question. Um, I really believe in getting permission for a photograph because I think you are taking something. And that's why it was so important that I would go back and give them their photographs because that completed the circle of taking the photograph and then giving it back to them. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with these people. I mean, I lived with them. Um, but word spreads pretty quickly that there's a Canadian photographer up here in the Carpathian Mountains. I mean, <laughs> it, and the, the thing that was also tremendously revealing is when I would give the photographs, it was usually at a specific, like a meeting place, like at one of the, the halls that they would have. And they would look at their pictures and go, oh my God, I'm so ugly. And they would all laugh and tease each other. And, and there was sort of this real humility about the way they looked and that it didn't really matter in some way, you know? So um, I get permission. I don't get written releases from these people. I, I, it's, it's not a business transaction. Um, it does become a business transaction when I sell the prints and you know, that gets into a whole thing about giving back. And that's an important, important part of, of it. But uh, yes, I spend time and the better work came out of going back and giving them the photographs. And then they're like, oh my God, he's part of us. He shows up in the middle of winter and nobody comes here even in summer. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's a real, I mean, these lives are, were, you know, there's no running water in the house. It's a well, there's an outhouse and, you know, using an outhouse in the middle of the night at 50 below, you don't forget it. Um, and uh, there's a marvelous story. I, 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 somewhere I've got a picture of Sergei Saborsky, but Sergei Saborsky and I would sleep in the same bed and I would have a wool hat on and I would wake up in his arms basically. And, you know, we're not lovers and we're not boyfriend and girlfriend or whatever, but it's so bloody cold. And he would turn and look at my eyes and goes, good morning, darling. <laughs> and, and, you know, the friendships that came out of these travels are the, the deepest friendships I have. And, and so I think to answer your question is, yes, I spent a lot of time with them. Yes, I got permission, what I call visual permission also, when somebody's looking at you with a camera, you don't have to say, hey, can I take your picture? You just have to shake your head like, is this okay? And they'll be like, yeah. Or sometimes they shake their head and walk away. So, you know, um, 
I was once in a graveyard and there was a single man digging a grave and I really wanted to take his picture because of the way the dirt was flying and he's sweating and glistening and he's so alive in this place of death. And I'm like, oh my God. And he turned and he was like, no, 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 no. And I, it was a moral dilemma and I almost took the picture, but I didn't. I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. A clear conscience makes for the softest pillow. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right, we can, um, this is a, a family that um, housed us uh, for a night and he has three brothers. He's the youngest of three brothers. And the title of this piece is hand-me-downs. And the older brother had gotten a copy of the Red Army hand-to-hand -hand combat training manual <laughs> and was using his brother as a practice dummy. Oh, no. So he... He's just been beat up a little bit. And I remember taking him aside and giving him a notebook and some coloring pencils. And I just said through Sergei, I said, you know what? It won't always be like this, you know? And so you can see his uncomfortableness about the hand-me-down clothing. You yeah. know, we all have a certain amount of pride, but that's all he got. And I love that he let me take his picture, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let it run. Any other questions? Yes, we do have some other questions. Thank you for the questions. Makes us way better. Ellen. Oh, this is titled, I love this picture. <laughs> this boy's name is Felix. And if you look at the photograph, that's burlap that's been stapled to the wall and they stuff it with hay to make more insulation because it gets rid of the, the wind coming in through the window. Oh, through the window, yeah. And so I'm, I'm like, I want to take your picture, Felix. So I went outside and... And he's taking a picture of me with his hand and I'm taking a picture of him. That's I just, beautiful. there's something for me that I just think is so, so sweet. Mm -hmm. Okay, let her, let it run. There you go. I'm, I'm sorry, you're interrupting the, I'm interrupting the questions. That's okay. Um, Ellen says, Ellen Kanar says, follow up on the one, on the experience of the subject. What were the reactions of folks when you give them a print of themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, the first part is that they, they can't believe that I've shown up. Like, you know, that's an action. You know, you show up. Can we just stop it here? Of course. Um, so you come back. Um, as I said, I'm not in a hotel. I, you know, like when I went back to the Ukraine, up into the Carpathian Mountains, I'm staying with Valentina. And then word spreads pretty quickly. And I don't like to although i did it once where i where valentina got to see everyone before everyone got to see their own picture and she was sort of a bit of a gossip <laughs> and so she's always saying oh my god i saw your portrait of Jaka. you're so fat you're like and i'm like oh my god i've been saying stuff like that <laughs> go and let you know it's kind of private in a way and yeah. uh and so i would go back with eight by tens wet prints that i made um fiber signed like because I'm proud of the work and in an envelope and, um, you know, I would give it to them. And um, most of it was real deep modesty is what, what I would get back from them. And they were grateful. They were like, then what gets really complicated is they're like, come stay with us, you know, and Sergey would have to say, no, 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 we're staying with family and, but we'll come and visit. And, the doors just literally flew open. That's um, amazing. And, 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 you know, Archie Lieberman about going back. And so what happens is on the second trip, part of why you get better, or I get better work is one, they trust me, but two, I'm the guy with the camera. That's Jocka. You know, it, it, it's like, it's not a stranger pointing a camera at me. It's like, you know, and then, I was there for my birthday in like 1993 and they held this huge birthday party where they, they slaughtered a lamb and made shashlik, which is lamb shish kebab. And we went and the villagers came and they gave me individual little like bouquets of flowers and, you know, and they're like, we will dance, you know, <laughs> these cows, these big, big Ukrainian gals like I was like a rag doll they would pick me up and just <laughs> dance with me like and my feet are not touching the ground <laughs> and that's lovely eating though. shushlik and 
you know, the, 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 it's a band like loose, you know, with a fiddle and an accordion and somebody banging on a tambourine sort of style drum. And, uh, I mean, the memories run deep. It, it, I learned about friendship. I learned about community. I learned about loyalty. I learned about a way of being a way of living. And, uh, I'm so grateful for it. I, I, I mean, I get choked up because it's so soul expanding, you know, it's, it's, it's fertile soil for the soul. That's beautiful. Um, I do have a question from Gabby Rondell. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Your work is touching and heartfelt. What is your best advice for distancing yourself from the story of your imagery? I heard what you said about stepping back. I am very close to a project that I'm working on now and want to have more of an objective eye. Do I share the work? I do share the work and did a portfolio review to get fresh perspectives. Great question. Uh, Gabby, um, I give two suggestions about how to approach that. One is you have to be very careful who you show your work to. If you show it to too many people, 50 people, you got 50 opinions and you're, you're more lost than you're found in that. So really do your homework about who you're asking to look at the work. The other great thing is do uh, printouts of it, just small eight by 10 printouts, not wet prints or anything, and put them up on the wall. Like, you know, if you've got 10 images or 20 or 50, put them up on the wall and be hard, be the critic, like forget the stories. Don't run those in your head. Just step back from that wall and look at it and go, you can, I run it in two directions. I usually run it, which is, which is the worst work up there and pull those down. You're like, what is the one that like, ah, terrible. You pull that down and then you, then you go the other direction. You go, what is the best work up there? And you're not trying to get to a number. You're just trying to like, this is the best work. And that goes on another wall. And you just leave it up and just keep looking at it. And it will reveal itself. You'll be like, oh my God, I can't take that image one more day. And it has, it has to go. And that's a way of removing yourself from the story. Because it, particularly if you're doing a body of work, the work literally will speak for itself to you. And I think that's a strong way of dealing with editing. Um, and it's more of a gut feeling than an intellectual thing because the intellectual part is where the story lives. But there's the heart part of the picture where it just speaks to your heart and that's where you wanna edit from. Awesome. Um, we, can, we can run some more pictures. I mean, I, sometimes you just get lucky because I was hanging out in a very Northern part of China in the Thai Lake provinces. And when <laughs> you're, you're definitely not Chinese when you're <laughs> like, you, yeah. you just don't stand out. And, and, and some kids, I don't know if they're scared of me or, or that, but I'm definitely a novelty. And so I was, I, I was photographing a woman right next to this who had just finished laundry and she was sitting there. And I guess this is her granddaughter. And the, the granddaughter kept coming up and looking through that screen door and laughing at me and running away. And so I'm like, I, I'm, I'm getting, I mean, I asked her grandmother, I like, she's like, yeah, um, you can take the picture. And I was with my friend Chong Bin, who's Chinese. And I think that's also important is that I have, I had my Beatrice in these countries to navigate, not that I was in hell, but, yeah. you know, I have somebody that would be like, hey, you know, Chong Bin was super proud of being Chinese, he's like, let me take you to China. So I had a guide that's a friend. And um, I think that makes it a lot easier to get underneath that curtain of trust and, and get into a, a culture. And so I was waiting, she came back up and you know, I got one frame of her, but I love that the wooden bar is like this horizontal smile. Like, you know, she's smiling. And I, it just cracks me up. He's sort of, the way she's sort of floating out of the, the pattern on the screen door. So yeah. you can let it run, Melissa, All right. please. Any other questions? Yes, Mark Geller asks, um, says these photos are all from 30 years ago, no? Have you been back in the post-Soviet years? I have not, I have not been back. Um, we. Go, can we go there? This is the woman who the screen door is next to her to the left. Um, I have not been back. I've been back to Cuba many, many times. I, um, what ended up happening is when this work was being done, I was single. 
I didn't have children. I didn't have any responsibilities. And um, uh, right in 1991, my mother fell 300 feet off a cliff and was killed. And I ended up, not to bore everybody with the details, but I ended up in a fairly, a bunch of lawsuits um, with my stepfather and her mother and, and that. And then I ended up getting married and having kids and buying houses. And, and I spent most of my efforts working in commercial, um, commercial advertising photography. And um, that's how I met Melissa. She taught me, she brought me literally into the digital world. <laughs> and and um, uh, so it's marvelous to be here today and see her thriving in her own right. But the short answer is no, except for Cuba. Um, I haven't been back to the Soviet Union now after it's been dissolved or China. I've been back to Mexico and Cuba um, on, on this project. It would be fascinating. There's some kids that I would love to see because they were five, six, seven, eight years old. So now they're, you know, 35, 36, 37 years old. And I'm sure they're married. They have their families. And that whole Archie Lieberman thing could kick in because I'm still in very close contact with Sergei Samborsky. You know, that's how I know Valentina died. But, you know, I got swept up in the, the river of life and it was taking me in other directions. And um once I had kids, I didn't want to be traveling like that because I would be gone for one, two or three months. Yeah. And uh, so, no, I haven't. But yes, the work is old. <laughs> um, Saul Bromberger, um, thanks. Thanks so much for this presentation, Jock. I love that your empathy for people shows through in your portraits. Did this work lead to editorial, commercial and advertising projects? Yeah. Great question, Saul. Uh, and you guys are welcome. I really want this sort of be about you guys and questions because, you know, I, I this stuff lives inside me. So I want to share it. So, yeah. So here's a great story about that. I used to see my relationship in photography, uh, the commercial. Um, can we pause it here? Of course. So the yin yang symbol is the commercial work was the money work. And that, and that supported me to be able to go for a month, two months or three months away. And, and so they were very integrated in that way. And so I did some assignment work for American Airlines for their in-flight magazine called, what was it called? American Way it was the magazine that was sit in the pocket when you would get on a flight for American Airlines. And I did some covers for them and, and you know, I photographed David Brower, who was the, the founder of the Sierra Club. And, and you know, they, they liked my work and I just pitched them one time. I said, hey, I have this body of work of portraits that I've taken in these very remote regions. And so I sent them to them. And they're like, oh, this is great. Let's, we'll do a, we'll do a story. And so they published like 12 images in the magazine. Well, the head art director um, at Hal Reine for Saturn Cars, saw the work and they're like this is the guy we want to shoot the next Saturn work and I was like oh my god I panicked when they called me because this was something super personal and it felt a bit like selling out but I also was like I don't think I can do this work commercially but they're like we'll just send you and a writer and if you want to take an assistant you just go you know we'll get the locations and and so the very first assignment for Saturn cars was to photograph the woman who was responsible for the interiors of Saturn cars. And I'm like, oh boy. I said, oh boy. <laughs> I just, <that's, laughs> but I got there and I had my camera out. And as soon as I got there, these two little boys just pressed their face up against the windows and were laughing at me. And I'm like, give me the camera. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I had my assistant drag him around in wagons and photograph the, the mom. And, and the short answer is yes, because if you are really showing people what your work is, that's valuable, particularly if you're not copying other people's work. It's your work. And that's what will get you assignment work, I believe. If particularly if you show it in conjunction with commercial work. So on one side, you're like, yeah, they can shoot commercial work and this is their personal work. And 
yeah. So that happened a lot for me. Great. All That's right. Great see that relationship. This this man is a hundred years old. I have another picture of him sitting on a bed and he's laughing at me. He said, "You're going to live longer because you photographed me." <laughs> wow. Keep it running. Yeah, let's run it. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Uh, then um, Edward Collins wanted to know if you called Valentina Babushka. Well, do you know what Babushka means? Isn't it baby? No, it means scarf. Babushka scarf? They wear the scarves. Oh. So a babushka is a woman who wears a scarf. And there's a whole language of hair in these these sort of cultures. One is if, if you're a young woman and eligible for marriage, mostly, not this isn't 100%, but you wear your hair down and you don't necessarily wear a scarf or, or you wear the scarf with your hair down. It means you're eligible. But you will see younger girls that are not eligible that are doing that. But a married woman wears her hair up under a scarf. This wow. woman is making teapots and on the wall next to her, it says, generations well here's a great story let's stop it here this man had me went to the authorities and had me and chong been arrested for spying on cuba i mean spying on, on china and we were held for three days in a hotel room under armed guard and what ended up happening is the colonel came in to interview us and Chong Bin, who's a very bright guy, said, you are making a big mistake. Jock McDonald is a huge fan of China, is here, here as, a, as a fan of China. And it's too bad you guys are so dumb and you'll never see how great his work is. Like, he let him have it. I could hear it in his voice. I don't speak Chinese either. But he was yelling at the colonel. And I'm like, Jesus, Chong, we're going to do 20 years here. Well, wow. And the colonel then, and, he, and Chong said, it's too bad you're, it, we're in such a backwater part of China that you'll never be able to see the, the film. And the colonel said, how do you process it? And Chong said, you know, I, I don't know if he said microdoll or whatever. And Chong turns to me, he goes, how do you process it? And I said, you know, it's, I use Dectol or I think I used microdoll back then. Microdoll, I said it at 68 degrees for 11 minutes. And, uh, you know, you rinse and he goes, 68 degrees, he goes, this is China, we're on Celsius. And I'm like, quick conversion, quick conversion, quick conversion, 20 degrees Celsius, I think is 68 degrees. Anyway, they processed my film and came back after three days and unrolled it ceremoniously, like these two rolls. They, I think they processed five of my rolls. Wow. And uh, then they took us to an extraordinary dinner and, and Chong Bin goes, I, I think you're probably the only photographer that's gotten free processing from the CCP. <laughs> <laughs> That's so that guy trusting. turned me in. That is pretty trusting. Yeah. Um, Stephen has a question. Yes, Stephen. Stephen Sommerstein. He says, with Stephen COVID Sommerstein? Yes. The world's most people. famous photographer from Selma? Yes. Hello, Steve. He, he says, with COVID and people dressing differently and culture shifted during this time, have you decided to shoot this material? No, I... <laughs> I've, I've basically, for the most part, stopped doing portraiture. Um, I am, I mean, I agree with you, Steve. People are, are dressed in their pajamas and they are running around and I don't have a lot of respect for that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a true statement that I don't give, give a flying F about you and I'm gonna wear my pajamas and I don't care if you have to look at me in my pajamas. I, I mean, Part of why we dressed as each other was as a culture is because people are looking at us and, and, and it's a form of respect. And, you know, don't get me started on the whole thing about saying no problem when what you're supposed to be saying is just you're welcome. I, I, somebody once pointed out when, if I hold a door for somebody or do something for somebody and they turn to me and, and you know, they no problem, that's two negatives. That's a no and it's a problem. I'm like, your welcome comes from German, which means to get in here. We're in here. Welcome. So I'm on a tyrant about that. Let's just start saying thank you and you're welcome, people. Um, but I haven't been photographing people in, in this current state of affairs of COVID because I don't like photographing disasters or pandemics or those things. Uh, there's other people that specialize in that kind of thing. 
and they're way better at it than me. And it doesn't interest me. Like after the fires in Napa, they're like, you should go out and photograph that. I'm like, it's the last thing I'm doing. Yeah. Steven says Bravo. So yeah, I've been weaving photograph lately. I cut up photographs, perfectly good photographs. And I weave them back together in this whole entropic disaster, as I call them death by a thousand paper cuts. <laughs> Can we go back and image that guy who's a of welder? Course. He <laughs> he made his own welding mask, but the best part is the wire underneath it is a sort of another little smile, but the welding rod that's holding it behind his head looks like an arrow through that. <laughs> it does. <laughs> anyway, let's roll on. Roll on. How are we doing on time? Are we all right? We're still good. It's 1146. Perfect. Uh, for those of you that in, are interested, I'm a big Instagram guy. I love Instagram. It's the river of images. And I'm the Jock McDonald, which I know it sounds a little, wow, he's pretty full of himself. <laughs> but I had somebody sign me up because I didn't know how to do it. Did you sign me up, Melissa? It wasn't me. It wasn't you. I don't remember who it was. One of your daughters. Might have been. Um, stop right here. This, this man... This is a, um, we're outside of Shanghai and I'm with a guy named Ken Baring who started the wheelchair foundation. And this man is praying that he will be given a free wheelchair. Yeah, next. I have another question from Catherine McDonald. She- Ah, asked... oh, we love the namesakes. Do you think these kinds of portraits are even possible anymore, given how much the world now gets photographed via cell phones, et cetera? Wow, Catherine, that's a great question. Um, it's a good question. Um, I do. I do, because I think if you just go back to this place of trust and showing up, like, you know, let's say you wanted to photo, I don't know what your project is or what you want to photograph, but I think that the answer is yes, it's still possible, but the world has really turned because of the cell phone and the camera and, you know, self-image awareness. Can we stop it here? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's possible. Um, I think you have to get very clear on one's intention about what you want to do. Um, I, I think that you probably could go up into these Carpathian mountains and this life still pretty much exists. Um, one thing I do know that's happened though, is a lot of the young people have gone to the big cities, you know, they're, they don't want to work the land. Um, and a lot of these very small towns are literally are going to die out. Um, and, uh, you know, that way of life, these very small tight knit communities, um, are failing, but to get back to the point, I mean, we're still human beings and we still carry all the emotions. And uh, I think it defaults to do great work is to trust. So you have to show up, you know, be generous in it and uh, um, show us how you see the situation because that's part of it, part of the perspective. This guy's name is Emilio. And if you see that other gentleman behind him, he's part of a full Cuban band. But Amelia is listening to his transistor radio. He's literally dancing to the tune of another tune. <laughs> I'm pretty good friends with Emilio. He's part of the government that leads tours. And he's just a very funny guy. He's 86 in this picture. Wow. And he still has the moves, baby. He still has the moves. All right, next picture. Great. Um, I hope I answered the question. The question is, is yes, it still exists. Um, it's up to you to show it. This is a tobacco farmer. <coughs> this is Batman. <laughs> That's awesome. This is Leo. Just one of the things I, I got really connected to the Cuban people is they are some of the funniest, most generous people that I've ever met in my life. And they didn't have any cell phones or any of that. So their, their self entertainment mechanisms are huge. Like they can just go to the beach and bottle of rum and people are telling stories and someone pulls out a guitar and, and uh, they really knew and how to hang out. And I don't, I now know, stop on this picture, please. 
Melissa. Oh. I didn't know how to hang out. I was always racing off to the next thing. And, uh, and they're like, no, no. You know, my, my nickname in Cuba is Senor Hamburguesi, which is Senior <laughs> Mr. Hamburger because of McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is of a long many generational family of rice farmers and she had never been photographed her entire life and she said what do i do with my arms and i love the vulnerability of that and that the background is similar to our arms i mean we're all in a, in a state of decay so next we can roll melissa please we have a couple of questions um, yes and please saul bromberger would like to know um if you have spent time in american farming and rural communities doing portraits of local folks in america united states yes i have i started in the most northern southern part of the united states which is a place called Cairo, southern illinois and if you go there and you say oh this is illinois they'll be like no this is Southern Illinois. And uh, it's in this slideshow. Um, I love calling it a slideshow. Um, it, yes, so the, the answer is yes. And uh, it was much more difficult than doing it in the Soviet Union or Cuba or Mexico or that because people are suspicious of photographers in the United States. And that might hearken to that idea. Can you still do the work? Yes, but you have to get the trust. Can we move the bar off of the image? Oh, sorry, a little bit. Please. Mm -hmm. um, can you stop it here for a second? The so wire. this is in the city now, it's not rurals, but I started doing these things called contact, contact cubism. And it, it came out of David Hockney's idea when he said painting is dead and he started doing pictures like of a sign in a desert and he would take a an instamatic camera and go you know click 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 and lay them down as a collage <clears throat> well i thought it'd be kind of spectacular to take that idea but just take make one image off of 12 images off of a roll of film so i would go you know one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and that's not photoshopped or anything the, the, the contact sheet becomes the image and I got hung up on doing this for quite a while. And then finally one day I'm like, oh God, let it go. So that's the inside of the building. The next image is the outside. Yeah. And you get funny things. You get the parallaxing happening and, and it, it's a little cartoony, but I just love the idea of this is that's how we actually see is we don't see like a photograph. We don't go click. We see in bits of information and we map it like a mosaic. And that's why we're all having such a different experience because everybody maps it differently and we look through different lenses, whether culturally or, you know, um, and that to me is super interesting. All right, any other questions? Yes, Ellen Konar asks if, uh, she says, you hinted that you believe in sharing the financial outcomes of your photography with the individuals in them. Do you have a system for doing so? I don't, and I didn't, but what I would do is I just gave out money when I were in those to people. And um, I also let Sergey dictate that or the people I'm with dictate how to do that because I'm such an outsider. And so a lot of times it would get donated to like a, a very grassroots community center. That The word community center is very loosely, but you know, sometimes I'm, I'm sure it was just used to buy vodka for a party. <laughs> So the short answer is no, but I do believe that it is, is generosity is a form of consciousness and it's important. I mean, it, I love Steve Martin's line in the jerk. He goes, I don't want the money. I want the stuff. <laughs> this is a granddaughter and a grandmother that I just, I set this photograph up, but I, you know, it's a little bit like a Dorian Gray where this, you know, aging back and forth. This is in Cuba in El Campo. Yeah, you can just run it. It's, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I stole that from Diane Arbus. And where is this? We're in Cuba. We're outside of uh, 
where are we outside Santiago in the south of Cuba. But here's an example like of playing marbles. You know, that that kid has like eight other friends around him playing marbles, but the concentration on it, on his on his hands and his face. That's a, a, a barn to dry tobacco. Those are all tobacco workers. I asked this guy why he rode side saddle. He goes, because it's way more comfortable. <laughs> this guy's making peat, you know, to burn. You know, in the farming, the, the kids are right there. That's the daycare. If they can help, they help. Carrying water in 100 degree weather. One of the things I love about the Cuban people, they're so self-assured. They, they don't have body image issues or they just, they are who they are. True. I'm lying on the hood of the car <laughs> to get that picture. And that kid's like, that silly gringo is going to fall off that car. <laughs> As it was moving? Yeah, yeah, we're driving, following him. Wow. Any other questions? Um, yes, Mar Mark Geller would like to know when were these Cuba photos shot? It's the only one that's been continuous starting in 1990 up until five years ago. So I, a lot of them are, I don't have the, the current work in there, um, a lot of it, but it spans the greatest amount of time from no cell phones to cell phones. This guy's making a saddle. He's a leather worker. Instrument maker. Any other questions that are? I don't have it. Oh, still using two and a quarter film or digital from Mark Geller. Um, my personal work is still on film. I'm actually about to do uh, Robert Mondavi's son's portrait, Tim Mondavi, and I'll be shooting eight by 10 and two and a quarter. This is Narvinia Thatch. We're in the United States now. He collected oil containers along the road and turned them into windmills. Uh, the preacher with the church's his hat. Rena in her store, we're in, in Louisiana now. I like windows because they're both, you're trapped and you're looking out in this way. Ernest, who was, he, he's a cane cutter in Louisiana and he rescued animals. Can we stop it here? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is the first portrait I did in the United States in Cairo, South Illinois. His name is Fred McClellan. And I'm just walking around. I don't know anybody here. <laughs> and I said, would you, could I take your portrait? He said, what, what, what? I said, can I take your portrait? He said, all right. And I took his port. He goes, did you get the broom? Did you get the broom in the picture? <laughs> I said, yeah, I think I did. He goes, we're both at about the same stages of our life. <laughs> Read that broom. Anyway, yeah. Next. This is a crawfish farmer in Louisiana. One thing I will say universally why I photograph farmers is they're so generous. They're so get in here. After photographing that crawfish farm, he said, now you come have a good crawl feed with us. Not those kind you get in a restaurant. Man, the crawfish was, <laughs> these are fighting roosters. What part of Mexico? We are just outside Guadalajara in Jalisco. You know, making tiles, making bricks by hand, you know. 
I got, I just love barbershops because I only get my hair cut once a year. <laughs> so I'm fascinated by them. <laughs> this is a church in that's occupied in a village by the Chenanteco Indians. There's no roads in and out of here. Uh, it's in Oaxaca and they don't speak Spanish. They speak Chenanteco and they have this full band. And this was taken on New Year's Day and they play music to ward off the spirits and bring the good spirits in. And it's this very amalgamated Christianity. <clears throat> but I love that, they're, that those, those sousaphones had to be walked through the jungle <laughs> to get there. I mean, it's surrealism was where you find it. This girl is caught right in the middle. It's titled between girl and woman. That's her father. He, he was the guy that walked us into the, into the village. That's his, his daughter. You know, making shoes out of tires. It was a very different part of the project. I lived in the Guadalajara dump for 10 days because there's a whole community that's there and they sort brooms because the handles are valuable and they're, they scavenge and the government put a fence around the dump and tried to lock them out. And there was a huge revolt that happened. It was just extraordinary. <clears throat> Stephen just wrote in, you have a marvelous time machine, great photos. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Love you. You know, and like the camaraderie, you know, you just two young boys that are just such good friends. There we are. That's it on that. Any other That's questions? It. I don't have any other questions unless we have any last ones. I see two on chat. What are we? I think they were answered. So my work, I shoot film. Um, I do shoot digital. You know, I shoot digitally because I I used I was teaching quite a lot and leading workshops in Cuba, and digital is such a great way to teach because if you're all and they're very small workshops, usually just six people, and you're if you're all in the same spot, in the same moment, let's say at a Cuban rodeo or 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 that or, and then that night everyone shows their best work you're like oh my god i was standing right there and i didn't see it and and there's such power in the immediacy of it you know it's like back in the day you'd have to do a workshop of polaroids <laughs> to do something like that and i think it's a great teaching tool i personally have a problem with it because when i'm shooting digitally and where I think we're all doing it is, you know, I'm looking through the viewfinder and then I'm checking the back of the camera and I'm not shooting very well and I'm not editing very well. I'm caught in this sort of doing it both place. And um, that doesn't work for me as well as shooting film. Um, Saul Bromberger would like to know uh, if you're working on a personal project now. Oh, you know what? I am corrected. I, hang on one second. Uh -huh. Babushka does mean grandmother. My apologies. You are correct and I stand corrected. All right, back to the question. Apologies to the babushkas out there. There you go. All right, um, what is the question? Saul, Saul would like to know if you're working on a personal project now. Uh, yes. Um, part of it is a love affair with helicopters and I, I'm slated to continue on with um, some aerial shooting of just um, nature from the air and how we intersect with that as human beings. It could just be a road or a single boat or um, I've come to this place now that I'm 60, which is like a confession. Jesus, Murphy, 60, <laughs> halfway to 120. I'm halfway there yeah. is that if you're not awed by nature and just humbled and the spirituality, like, then I'm not paying attention. And so my work is mostly now about nature. And a lot of it is about water. My wife loves to tease me how I say water. 
She says, you say water funny. I'm like, no, you do. You say water funny. Um, and when digital photography really came roaring in on the cell phones, I stopped taking pictures for a, about a year and I just journaled and wrote about photography because um, I was getting close to giving it up. I was like, what's the point if, if there's just so much photography and it's irrelevant in a, yeah. in a sense? And so, you know, I wrote what made photography great. Well, one of the greatest things about photography is that, that it is truly magic. It is the only thing that freezes time. And freezing time, I'm sorry, is magic. It just is. And they're frozen memories. And, and so that's a real power. Um, but I have always been searching for our commonality. What connects us? There's so much disconnect going on. You know, you're, I'm white, you're black, you're gay, I'm straight, you're, you know, you're young, I'm old, you know, you live in Nicaragua, I'm rich, you're poor. There's all these buckets that we've been put into. Yeah. And a lot of that is cultural and there's some very wrongs that need to be righted. And I, I think that part of writing the wrongs, you know, there's somebody once said, you want to know what the state of prejudice or, or where we are in, a, in it? It goes, who comes in your house? How many Nicaraguans come in your house? How many Cubans come in your house? How many Chinese come in your house? Is it just white people? And I'm like, wow, that's pretty powerful. <laughs> that's bringing it home. Yeah. And so when I was writing about photography, I made lists and lists and lists of what we share as human beings. And the list is really long. And the list that separates it, I think it's five things. I think it's gender, geography, language, religion, and money, I guess would be on that list in a, in a way. But the list that we, you know, we, we come from mother and daughter, we breathe air, we drink water, we have five toes, we have two eyes, we hear, we listen to music, we cry. It just, and so my project is about, the reason why I photograph water is it's the original mother. It's our, it's what we, it's the most basic thing we share, air and water, I think. And then there's food and the, it kind of goes from there, but it's our, cradle you know water it's mm -hmm. the tears that run down our face once fell from the sky as rain you know the water we ingest we perspire it evaporates and we're caught in this beautiful wheel of of energy of water and reincarnation and i take great solace in that um so that's what i'm working on that's my newest newest i've been working on it for five or six years now so that's what i'm on Lovely. I do have a question or a comment from Stephen. Um, great photographers trump smartphones. A thousand smartphones have ten great photos. One great photographer has a thousand great images. <laughs> I think I just have one, but I don't know which one it is. <laughs> Stephen, you beast, you animal, you you seer of sights. For everyone that's listening. Steve Summerstein took the quintessential of Martin Luther King taken from behind at Selma with that talk. It was used for the movie that they stole from you, but thank God you spanked them for that one. There it is. Yeah. Oh my God. I have his card in my office. So yeah, beautiful photograph. And St Stephen, what, a, what an honor to have you on, on deck today. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. And no. Melissa, thank you. Thank you, Harvey Milk. Thank um, you, Jock. Um, I prefer to do this in the flesh. You know, I love it, an audience. And yes, I often hand out freebies at these things, you know, give away books or photographs. And we'll have to do it again. Yeah, let's. Maybe at your next show. <laughs> okay, the water show. Oh, the that light was of... so lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, thank you for having me and um, appreciate it. Those are great questions, uh, folks, that you, yes. you sent thank in. You. Thank you so much for all the questions. Um, I'll just close out and thanking Jock and, for- And if you're, inter the Instagram thing is a great thing because I, I respond or, you know, you want to run an image by or have a conversation. I use Instagram for that stuff. Do you want to put your Instagram uh, on the chat? Sure. Put that um, in there. Actually, it's not capitalized. There you go. 
And I'll just say thank you to everybody that joined us today. This was lovely. Of course, I would have loved to have had this in person in our gallery, but hopefully, oh, right. hopefully the next time around we will. Um, thank you to the City of San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department that Harvey Milk is part of, the Cultural Arts Division, and the Photo Center staff, members, volunteers, and our recently formed Friends of Harvey Milk Photo Center nonprofit. So if you guys have any questions, comments, please feel free to contact me. And then if you need to contact Jock, um, I have all his contact info here at the yeah. center, or I'm sure we can get it from Instagram too. Yeah, either way, the door's open. Um, us photographers have to stick together, man. Definitely. As uh, the sheriff of San Francisco said about my work, he said, you're under arrest for overexposure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. All right. Thank you, Jock. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Leave meeting.